So what about this one? Now they again tell you a story of a specific enzyme. They're not going to ask you to memorize what amylase does, right? But it affects the breakdown of carbohydrates, specifically that one that we call amylose. A little review now. It was a starch, if you remember, an energy storage polysaccharide, but will not affect the breakdown of proteins. Why? Because proteins won't fit in the active site of this enzyme. The ability of it to interact with specific molecules is most directly, those are often key terms, determined by the number of molecules involved. No, that's a substrate concentration thing. That's doesn't, that, that doesn't give it its ability to interact with that molecule. The sequence of bases present in ATP, that's way out in left field. The amount of glucose, that's kind of like number of molecules. That's no good. You know, we skipped the right answer on purpose. It's the shape of the molecules involved, the substrate and the enzymes. And I will add also charges, like we said, shapes and charges. Here's what they like. Here's a description of an experiment with the data results of the experiment. They also might put the results in graph form. Okay, but here it's in a table. They tell you a story of another specific enzyme, catalase, an enzyme that speeds up the breakdown of hydrogen peroxide. You might be familiar with that a little bit. And they tell you it breaks down into the products water and oxygen gas. So now you look at this table, and as time goes by, they are measuring hydrogen peroxide breakdown. And they are giving you some kind of number of molecules per minute. And clearly, not much is happening here. And then here, a whole bunch of molecules are getting broken down per minute. That big change occurred between minute 1 and minute 1.5. And that's what they ask you. I should have had you practice what I told you uh, previously. When you get a question like this, I would go straight to the question. Read it first. And then, now that you know what they're going to ask you about, have that in your back pocket when you go read the info. Okay, so this again is the correct answer. That is when this table clearly shows that uh, they added some catalase, that thing that so greatly speeds up reaction, that enzyme was added between these two time periods. Now we go to ATP. I decided to stick this in here. It also applies greatly to something we'll study in the third quarter, like how you break down uh, your lunch for energy. So I'm going to introduce it here. And this ATP is the initials for this big chemical name. Uh, here it is, adenosine triphosphate. Here's the red ink again. That means this is right out of EOC. Connect the role of this to energy transfers within a cell. So here we go. What does the cell use energy to do? Well, it uses energy to move things around, maybe even including itself, the cell, to move things around another way, move it in and out of cells, maybe move it along some other pathway. And it uses it to do chemistry, especially to drive those reactions that need energy, the endergonic ones, or to help start the ones with activation energy, like a match to that Cheeto, that are actually exergonic but need some activation energy to start. ATP then, I'm going to make this analogy, is like a little battery. It is the source of energy that can make something run like your cell phone. So I'm going to make that analogy in a second. Here's what ATP looks like. You kind of recognize this? If I said this is an organic molecule, and it is, which of the four categories do you think it fits best? Carbohydrate, protein, lipid, nucleic acid. Hopefully you said nucleic acid. Because if you recognized this part of it, that's a nucleotide. It's just got a couple extra phosphates on the end. And those are key in this. But this molecule has got a totally different function then RNA and DNA, which we said briefly was like a recipe to make proteins, the function of this is a little battery, but it's actually a piece of an RNA and a DNA. So, 
This is the part that's called adenosine, adenine, and ribose stuck together. And these three phosphates give it the name triphosphate, very simply. So how does it work? How does its action work like a battery? Well, here you go. This ATP, if it has a phosphate split off, which would be this last phosphate, the energy in that bond then gets released when that catabolic reaction happens, which is also hydrolysis, so water's involved. We're not focusing on that right now. But the splitting of this ATP is how this battery gets used. Now that it only has two phosphates, diphosphate, therefore we call it ADP, it's like a battery that's half charged because it still has some energy in it. And if you took this battery and split this last phosphate off, you would have adenosine monophosphate. And that would be like a dead battery. Because even though it still has a phosphate, a cell can't split that off to release energy. So we have like fully charged battery, half charged battery, dead battery. How do you figure you would recharge this battery? Because this is like your cell phone battery. You can recharge it. Well, in this case, mechanically, you would make this dead battery a half-charged battery by adding a phosphate back on. That would be an anabolic endergonic reaction. You'd have to put energy into it, just like you have to plug your cell phone battery into something, some energy source, to charge it up. How would you recharge this half-dead battery? By... Adding another phosphate. Where's that energy going to come from to recharge these batteries? Your lunch. What part of your lunch do you figure is used to recharge these? The parts that we identified have energy. The carbs and the lipids. Right? Now I'm going to make another analogy. Why does your cell need these little batteries? Why don't they just use carbs and lipids if they have energy in them. It's kind of the same reason why your cell phone doesn't use your car battery. If you hooked your cell phone up directly to your car battery, the energy from it would melt it, literally. Set it on fire, it's too much. A carbohydrate like glucose or a lipid is like a car battery. It's got energy in it, but it's too much. But chemistry has evolved that allows these big car batteries, so to speak, to be used to recharge your little cell phone batteries. So ATP would be like a little cell phone battery to your cells. Good analogy, huh? Right? The stuff in your lunch, like a car battery, can be used to recharge these. But these are the little batteries your cell needs to use. By the way, why did the scientists eat photons for lunch? Because he just wanted a light snack. Isn't that a good one? That is so, I can hardly stand it. So, here's a specific example of that ATP works. I'm going to go faster, no extra charge. If you don't follow this, it's not that big a deal, but you can replay this and see. So, here's two reactants that get stuck together. This is a chemical reaction that happens in your cells, right? But it doesn't happen very easily. This anabolic endergonic reaction requires energy. That's what these numbers are. Needs plus that much energy. That means it's not going to happen very much without some help. Well, one of the things that comes to the rescue is ATP. If we take this glutamic acid, and that's one of the amino acids, if we take this glutamic acid and attach a phosphate to it from this ATP, now this thing can combine with this quite easily and the phosphate comes off, right? So here's why that little ATP battery losing its phosphate 
which releases energy, but specifically what happens is the phosphate gets attached. Here's specifically why connecting what we just got finished with. There's no enzyme that these two fit in to make this happen. One just hasn't evolved, but there's an enzyme that'll fit this thing into that with its active site. Why will this fit and this won't? Because it's a different shape. It's got a phosphate attached. So if that makes sense, that combines the ATP action with the enzyme action we just talked about. And hopefully it makes sense. So this is uh, the recharging this battery we talked about. But here's a statistic that's kind of astounding, like the turnover number. In just one of your muscle cells, when it's working, and those are very active cells, they use a lot of energy. Over 10 million little ATP batteries are used and recharged per second in every cell. The numbers are really staggering. And all that's powered, again, by molecules in your lunch. Where in your cells do you figure these batteries get recharged? Where did you learn was like the energy factory of a cell? Those cell parts called mitochondria. So now I'm working ahead because we're coming up to cells as our next unit.